Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. In today's episode, we're dealing with the eighth deep dive in the series. It's a serious look at a serious subject. We're going to look at the autopsies in the uh, Watts family murders. It is a sensitive subject. It's a subject we need to approach with care, with compassion, with sensitivity. If you, someone is going to be triggered or upset or uh, offended in some way by the subject matter, then you shouldn't listen to this episode. This is the eighth episode in a series of ten episodes. The ninth episode will deal with the vehicles. And the final episode will kind of be a a Q&A dealing with questions that I've actually collected um, and will try to answer and address. um, And you guys can obviously also ask questions during that. I'll let you know when that happens. Every now and then on YouTube, it's often people new to this channel will say, wow, you are a rambling, monotone, you're so boring, you never get to the point, uh, get to the point. So I'm going to give you you guys that option. Um, There isn't really anything in the autopsy reports. Let me say that again. We're going to go through the autopsy uh, reports now. There isn't really anything that is going to, that's kind of like a smoking gun, put it that way. The autopsy doesn't reveal time of death for any of the three victims. And it's kind of murky what the manner of death is, certainly in two of the three victims. So that's the autopsies in a nutshell. So if you wanted the abbreviated version in less than two minutes, there you have it. And you can now uh, turn the video off and, and go and do something else. That's the autopsies in a nutshell. Okay, off you guys go. Right, so I just want to thank the uh, 300 or so people who have subscribed in the last couple of days. Uh, good to have you here. If you haven't subscribed yet, you can click on the little icon on the bottom right. Uh, Or you can ring the bell for notifications, like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. So we pick it up on page 622 of the discovery documents. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, and we are going to get to the actual autopsy reports, but this is just a... um, uh, synopsis and a narrative from agent tammy lee explaining the circumstances around the actual autopsy procedure Um, it happened on a friday so the the murders happened on monday possibly also sunday night but basically monday and the disposal of the bodies monday morning the autopsies of all three of those bodies happened on friday morning and that morning, which is August 17th, uh, Colorado Bureau of Investigation agent Tammy Lee went to the McKee Medical Center on 2000 North Boys Avenue in Loveland, Colorado to attend the autopsies. And um, she says Shanann's body had been recovered the evening of Wednesday, August 15th. And so it took a whole sort of half day and even afternoon to recover the children from separate oil tanks okay and then we go to the narrative she arrived at the medical center at about 10 o'clock in the morning and she was there with um joey weiner uh sorry it's probably actually probably weiner um, it, the autopsy is performed by Dr. Michael Burson and his assistant, the Weld County Deputy Coroner Joey Weiner. Uh, also present was Carl Blesch, the, who's the Weld County Coroner, the Weld County Chief Deputy District Attorney Steve Wren, uh, the Weld County Deputy District Attorney Patrick Roche, FBI Agent Graham Coder 
and CBI crime scene analyst Eric Bryant. So quite a large group of people present for that. Prior to the performing of the autopsies, Wren read an email aloud to Dr. Burson, which included a request by the public defender, by the public defender's DNA expert, to have the necks of the victim swabbed um, for fingernails and X-rays. Now, now obviously, what that was intended was to check for Shanann's DNA in the children's necks based on already the defense case that was happening at that that point. The first autopsy was performed on Shanann Watts. Shanann had x-rays taken prior to the autopsy and uh, it, the doctor was informed that Shanann had had prior neck surgery. So Shanann actually had a vulnerability before the crime even happened in that um, she had an operation on her neck, what sort of seen that brace around her neck, who knows what he would have thought of. That that happened just a year earlier. So he would have known that, that she kind of had this sort of fragile um, component to herself, whereas the children had something else that was fragile. They were allergic, they, they struggled with their breathing, and... Um, they were often on medication, Shanann as well. Shanann was wearing a purple grey t shirt, black bra and blue thong underwear, which were removed and collected as evidence. Now I wonder whether whether Shanann's friends, Nicole and Cassie, would have known what underwear she wore in Arizona. I don't know whether they would have shared a hotel room. I don't know whether they would have spoken about something like that, but you never know. It would be interesting to know if she was wearing that, uh, you know, when she was on the plane. Just would be interesting to know. Shanann appeared to have a large amount of skin slippage and her amniotic sac protruding from her vaginal area. And I think that is the reason for the blood on the sheet. So you can also see that the skin slippage, you might think that, that the skin slippage that the children had was entirely due to the oil, but it, but it is kind of a classic um, thing that happens post-mortem. The body sort of shrivels, I guess, and, and then that happens. Dr. Burson examined the amniotic sac and removed Shanann's fetus. The fetus was collected as evidence and CBI laboratory manager Aaron Koning arrived during the autopsy to transport the fetus directly to the CBI's forensic laboratory. If you ask me, this fetus is actually the reason for the, the, the crime. It is. It was Watts's intention to get rid of this fetus because he understood that that was what Kessinger felt she could give to him as a first and so he felt he needed to get rid of that so that they could have that moment and so that, that so that she could have this um, not second best experience with him possibly within a marriage bear in mind she was googling wedding dresses they both told each other they loved each other her friend was getting married she was certainly at the age where she was probably thinking about it so I think the fetus did have a lot to do with with everything and, and um, I think it went from wanting to destroy the fetus to eventually kind of just destroying everybody, just um, getting everybody out the way. And there's something reckless about that, don't you agree? I mean, it's a gross understatement, but... Do you agree that if you are a person who wants to get rid of one other person, as bad as that is, and it's an unborn other person, you end up getting rid of three other people as well? It's, um, it's reckless. It's, anyway, it's kind of sadistic, but in a, in a very clumsy, silly way. Disgusting, obviously, but, but those things as well. Going further through it, during Shanann's autopsy, Dr. Burson pointed out several important findings. 
He advised that Shanann's hyoid bone was not broken, although he pointed out bruising to the soft tissue on the right side of the hyoid bone. Dr. Burson also noted bruising to the muscles and tissues in Shanann's neck. Let's just pause for a moment on this. Um, the hyoid bone is in manual strangulation is typically not broken just because it's a very flexible elastic structure in the neck it's it's actually kind of something that if you put your own hand over your neck right now and you um you close it gently and you move it up and down you can actually feel the hyoid bone there and it is a, a structure that that helps uh, as far as i know keep keep the throat sort of open and it it it, uh, it floats in the neck area in the throat area and so it is kind of an ingenious structure in the sense that it's uh, a a tough kind of cartilage that floats inside of a fleshy channel if i can put it that way and so if you think about how that formed in the womb how the high, something like the hyoid bone formed it is quite an amazing thing to think about let me just express that um, a little bit further. You know, when a plant grows or a, um, any any creature sort of grows, it builds something onto something else. So when a plant grows, the, the stem comes out, branches come off the stem and leaves off the branches, right? Now, to have something that is a fairly strong structure come out of a... A soft structure is uh, that's what, all I'm saying is quite ingenious I do know that with the strelitzia plant big uh, sword like leaves come out of other other leaves so the leaf itself is born inside another leaf and and I personally find that quite magical and quite amazing so anyway just to come back to the hyoid bone the hyoid bone is classically associated with manual strangulation so I've attended trial quite a few times where, uh, where that has been discussed. I've been in court where that the pathology has been discussed both in the prosecution case and the defense case. Um, I've covered it in detail in the Rebecca Zahao case. And let me try and explain to you very, very briefly. When the hyoid bone is not damaged, it tends to be indicative of ligature strangulation, right, or uh, something like suicide. So if somebody uh, hangs themselves or is murdered through a ligature, meaning something like a tie or a belt or a rope or a cord, then what happens is the ligature kind of moves over the hyoid um, structure and kind of hugs the the jaw it's looking for the the path of least resistance and so it moves over the hyoid bone and it kind of uh, becomes tighter it constricts the um, features of the of the throat and and um, and neck just below the jaw right and the hyoid bone is far beneath that and so typically classically where someone isn't manually strangled, um, the the hyoid bone is not damaged, right? Such as Rebecca Zahao. Another example is Susan Roder. That's a South African case. That is a case where the uh, state had to prove that the um, victim was uh, strangled and the defense was that she had hung herself on the back of a ba uh, bathroom door, so in a hotel room. So the husband had claimed that um, his wife, when she found out he wanted to divorce him, had, had just hung herself. And so you had literally a war between the pathologists. I think there were two on the def on the state side and three, ultimately three on the defense side. and. Basically, it was almost like who can shout the loudest, repeat the same things, and then maybe the judge will take that version. And of course, um, 
I can't uh, remember that case off the back of my, um, you know, it's not, not at the top of my mind right now, but what came up was the damage to the hyoid bone, which suggested manual strangulation, which suggests murder, right? And how it works with manual strangulation is when something as large as a hand moves over the neck or throat of a, of a living person, then the hyoid bone's got nowhere to go because you've got this big hand clamping down on the throat and that the hand isn't small enough or in theory, in theory agile enough to move to the top of the, the neck. Um, and so anyway, so the, the hyoid bone's got nowhere to go and so the hyoid bone gets crushed um, in this tussle and 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 then it, it it bleeds so the hyoid bone can be slightly fractured and can be bruised and that is what happened in Shanann's case and that is why the hyoid bone is such a classic um, a classic forensic item in terms of finding out you know there was someone strangled now just sticking to this for a, for a kind of a second longer there's no damage to the hyoid bone of the children. Now, you could say, well, that doesn't really matter. They were smothered. So so that, that kind of suggests what didn't have his hand on the throats of his children just over their mouths. Um, that seems to me to be unlikely. Because if you had your hand over their mouth with a blanket they could still wriggle and shake their heads where something on the throat is definitely more lethal. Just something to th think about. So bear in mind in the, in the version that Chris Watts has given, he, he strangled essentially all three victims. You could say smothered, but bear in mind during the confession to his own father, his father said, use different words like choked, smothered and strangled and what sort of went with all three of them and th that is why we, we we still have some kind of uncertainty about what happened and the autopsy results are a little bit ambiguous in that respect in terms of Shanann it does look like she was strangled manual strangulation of the throat but of the children it's a little bit more ambiguous so that's the one thing Dr. Burson also noted bruising to the muscles and tissues in Shanann's neck that is kind of an artifact of that struggle, that life and death struggle, having hands around her throat and her neck to the extent that it bruised them, this forceful um, grip around her neck and throat and then the struggle against it. That also suggests that Shanann didn't simply lie there and die. Um, I, I'm, I must say, for me, one of the most incredible things in this case is Chris Watts saying that she didn't struggle and people saying, yeah, I think that makes sense. I've heard people actually make arguments saying someone did that to them and they also didn't struggle. Anyway, um, Dr. Burson advised he did, did not note any other trauma to Shanann's body and found no evidence of disease. So it looks like her lupus was in recession possibly she didn't have lupus I don't think that's the case sorry not recession remission um, but it is interesting that that was mentioned I'm a little bit disappointed that the investigators on the scene didn't sort of bring that up um, but anyway it's it's uh, it's not not mentioned there Dr. Burson advised um, so there was no defensive wounds Dr. Burson advised Shanann's preliminary cause of death was asphyxiation due to manual strangulation. And that is, I believe, correct. And because of that, you've got to ask yourself, how on earth could Watts have strangled her without her injuring another part of herself and also her injuring him? And that is a bit of a mystery regarding this case, which I've tried to resolve with my own... Um, theory. In the Jason Roder case, his wife was covered in little injuries. Uh, bru There's a big bruise on the inside of her thigh. 
um, he he explained that as she'd done weights, or she, I think she'd done a handstand and, and fallen or dropped a weight onto her thigh, and it was actually a days old injury, which I don't believe. But she had many many injuries um, to herself. I would be lying if I told you I can remember the injuries he had, but what we do know is he, after his wife uh, died, he, after his wife had died, he he he, uh, he shaved and sort of cleaned himself up, and um, that obviously is a bit strange, you know, taking a shower under those circumstances. Um, the second autopsy performed just bear in mind with the rotor case i'm a little bit rusty on it so um i may be a little bit slightly off with some of my my thoughts uh the second autopsy performed was on four-year-old bella bella was dressed in a pink night nightgown covered in butterflies and a pair of underwear so it's pretty incredible that as hard as as it was to stuff the children in the tanks they were still actually clothed as well that also just seems to me to be quite reckless. And you might say, well, why would you change Shanann's shirt, the shirt that she arrived home in, but not change the clothing of the children? I think the difference is the one involved a physical wrestle and attack where, where Watts was physically on Shanann and potentially getting his the fibers of his clothing onto her and vice versa and but also he may have literally torn the shirt she was wearing you could also say she tore the shirt she was wearing you could also argue that he may have tried to use her shirt as a way as a ligature he may have pulled the shirt over her head and then pulled the shirt around her throat but it doesn't look like that's the case based on the autopsy but now, so why would he not remove the clothing of the children? Well, that is why I said I don't think that they were smothered or strangled because he didn't really feel like there was any evidence of struggle or whatever or, or any problem with his DNA on them. The other thing could be that by throwing them into the oil tanks, he felt that any evidence like that would be destroyed. Now, something like clothing fibers wouldn't be wouldn't necessarily be so anyway that's just something worth considering as I said at the beginning of this study um, we don't really get very much out of the autopsy reports Bella also had a large amount of skin slippage Bella was x-rayed and there was concern that she may have a broken jaw and I think that that is quite incredible is that they sort of they looked at Bella's little body and they saw something that they couldn't explain so they had her x-rayed and there seemed something wrong with her her mouth. There seemed something wrong around the chin sort of area and so they, in other words, outwardly, just sort of looking at her. And so they, um, maybe there was swelling around the mouth area and so the x-rays were sent to a pediatric radiologist who advised it appeared to be gas in the area of the jaw and not an actual fracture. So somehow there, there was some kind of idiosyncrasy with Bella where um, something seemed, there seemed to be some kind of reaction with the, the oil and it created this kind of bulge or something in the jaw. And, and so there wasn't a fracture, there was just um, some kind of uh, interaction with the chemicals. It also appeared Bella had some scrapes to her, but to her buttocks. And just by the way, John Bonnet Ramsey did as well. Uh, now we go to page 623. And also the tops of her shoulders. Now, you should bear in mind that these scrapes are visible despite the fact that she's been submerged in oil for about four days despite the fact that it is you know there's been decomposition and skin slippage so these scratches I think were quite severe 
And I think a important question to ask is, I think I know what the answer is, but I think you should still ask the question. Did these scratches and scrapes occur post-mortem or not? And that opens up a kind of a can of worms because as soon as you say that the, the scrapes on her buttocks and the tops of her shoulders occurred before death, then you make the whole argument of these are defensive wounds. Bella was fighting for her life, running away from her father, fighting her father off her, etc., etc. I don't think that's the case. I don't think what is that kind of person and I don't think this crime has those kind of features. And so what is the explanation for the, the scrapes to her buttocks and the tops of her shoulders? Well, think about the morphology of the human frame. The widest part of a body that is being pushed feet first into a small orifice is obviously the buttocks from the perspective of between the feet and the hips, right? And then again, the widest part after the hips is the shoulders. And so it does make sense from that perspective that, that these injuries were inflicted post-mortem in the effort to, which is quite gr grotesque to think about, the effort of forcing this little body, this little frame through this very, very small hole. And it does make sense that you see these injuries on Bella, but not on CC, because CC was just slightly smaller. Dr. Burson pointed out several important findings. He advised Bella's frenulum, that is the skin connecting the top lip to the gum, was torn, which created a large hole. The inside of Bella's gums and inner lip also appeared bruised. So they couldn't say this for sure, it appeared bruised um, and then you had the tearing of the frenulum. Now the district attorney said that this was because Bella fought back and Bella was alive and Bella was aware of what was going to happen to her. Um, this is possible of course and this is what makes the Watts case quite uh, compelling, fascinating, troubling and frustrating is we can't say for sure. My explanation for this is the exact same reason why there are the, the scrapes on the buttocks and on the tops of the shoulders. That her frenulum was damaged as she went through the hatch and it was damaged from a, a vertical movement, not a side by sideways movement. A sideways movement is what you'd expect in terms of um, something like a smothering. And I don't think the damage would be to the frenulum, it would be to the throat. That's just my interpretation. Um, also, th I think the stomping on her shoulders to force her small body through that, that orifice caused the head to, the, the, the deceased head to bang against the, the side of this um, container. And uh, you could make the argument, well, then why don't we see blood, which is quite a good counter argument. And my answer is, well, because of the venting, because the venting destroyed that evidence, because the venting um, covered that evidence either in oil or blasted it away. Um, that is, and, and also because she, was, because she was dead at the time, the bleeding was less as well. So those are my explanations for that. Um, I could be wrong, but that is just the way I interpret it. And that is what happens with autopsy autopsies you see evidence like you see a crime scene and you you try to uh, interpret them sometimes you misinterpret them but over time I think you get better at it um, so there he says it it appeared Bella bit into her tongue that I also think happened during the stomping it is basically the 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 jerking of her head as she's being stomped to get her through the, the thief hatch. As I said, this is very disturbing to, to consider. Um, my, um, my approach to all of this is as grotesque and grim as it is, it all happened post-mortem. So Bella wasn't aware of it. Uh, what would have seen it? And I think that is the part that is the most disturbing. But 
you know, whatever happens to you after you've died, um, not to make light of it, but whether you're thrown into a vo volcano, cast out into space where the worms eat your body or uh, you're frozen, uh, it makes no difference. You're not going to perceive any of that. It's very grim and grotesque to us on the side of life looking looking at this. But if it did happen post-mortem, it's not um, anything Bella would have experienced. And I think there should be some comfort in that. Um, but I think, you know, it is the human, it is human nature to see this sort of thing and be disturbed by it. By the way, it's quite interesting to note that Detective Bormhove is absent from, from these, this group of people. And we know that he suffered post-traumatic stress. It's possible that he asked not to attend. We know he was present at the recovery of the, of the bodies. Um, so here he says, Dr. Burson indicated Bella's injuries were consistent with downward pressure on the nose and mouth. Downward pressure, which is pushing them through the hatch. Now, they interpreted it as something like a hand pushing down on the, the mouth and nose. I don't agree with that. Um, so if you think about the downward pressure, it's, it's kind of... Um, Another way to interpret it is just the body being pushed down against a hard surface. Dr. Burson indicated Bella's death was violent as it appeared she struggled to get away. So that is how he interprets it based on what he's seen and based on all his other experience in this sort of thing. Um, and I, I, I disagree. I don't think Bella's death was violent. Um, I think it could have been. But... My, the true crime rocket science position is that Shanann's death was violent and the Chorin's deaths weren't. And I think uh, a lot of people want to imagine that, that everything was as violent and as horrible as it possibly can be because it, they like this idea that they are good and Watts is, you know, especially if Watts is as bad as he possibly can be, then that means they are totally different to him and, and they are very, very good. So the worse he is, the more monstrous he is, the more comfortable it kind of is. Um, I um, I don't see it that way. I think that he um, didn't intend really to hurt any of his family. I think he did want to get a divorce. If he could get Shanann to have an abortion, that would have helped his case. Obviously, we're not saying him cheating on his wife was right or anything like that. But... Um, if you just think about how he was trying to bring about the abortion in the beginning, it was through this sly way of trying to poison Shanann with oxycodone. Now, I believe that same methodology, because uh, he's got nothing actually against his unborn child. He simply wants to have a son with somebody else. There's nothing personal in, in it. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to like, um, violently get hold of his child, the fetus, and, and, beat him up. He's got no, there's nothing personal in it in that sense. Um, and so I don't think there was really anything that personal with his children either. I think it, he, he would have killed them in a non-violent way, in my opinion. And, and so I think Dr. Burson is um, overly aware of other violent deaths and that is what he's seeing here. Bear in mind Dr. Burson would have ha wouldn't have had that much experience of um, people being forced through thief hatches in, in his, his career, if, if ever. So anyway, he says, Dr. Burson's pre preliminary cause of death for Bella was asphyxiation due to manual smothering. Now, bear in mind what we're looking at here is the exact same cause of death for Shanann. Asphyxiation due to manual smothering. Now, if you go and look at that with Shanann, um, asphyxiation due to manual smothering. Well, their injuries are different. Shanana's injuries to a hyoid bone, the children don't. Um, Shanana's injuries to and bruising to a neck, and sh and uh, the children don't. I don't buy the argument that because the children are smaller and what's is more powerful, that 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 prevented them from getting injured. Especially if you consider the story that. Um, Bella knew what was going to happen to her 
and fought back and still didn't get injuries to her the the the, the muscles that should have gotten injured the throat the neck um, you could argue that that the lips formed part of that you could definitely make that argument but I think it's a more compelling argument that that the lips got jammed against the edge of the thief hatch um, because of the tightness of it you know if he stomped on her and and her head sort of moved backwards it did mean that her her lips were sort of being pushed upwards I apologize for the the visual there the final autopsy performed was on three-year-old Celeste Celeste had just turned three she was dressed in a pink nightgown mini mouse underwear and a pull-up the nightgown and underwear were collected as evidence Celeste had a large amount of skin slippage. Celeste did not have any obvious signs of injury or bruising to her neck area. So, again, you have the two children that just don't have the same signs of injury. I also did not observe any injury to Celeste's mouth or face, to include Petitia. And I, that is what I want to highlight in the autopsy reports. And that is something like the hyoid bone that is idiosyncratic to manual strangulation. Right? Let me say that again. When someone is strangled to death, the petechial hemorrhages that occur are like little vessels, very small fragile capillaries in the eyes, in the cheeks, um, in the face. Um, I think that you also get them in the lungs. Um, very, very small, fragile um, kind of capillaries and they, they rupture as the body struggles to survive, struggles to breathe. So they're typically associated with violent manual strangulation and this, this um, incredible effort to try and fight to survive right and so these little vessels rupture they burst they hemorrhage and so you often with people who've been manually strangled you find uh, the redness in the eyes where they they've uh, ruptured and also sort of these little flares these little fiery plumes in the cheeks where they've also ruptured and we did see that with um, John Bonnet Ramsey, which is why I believe John Bonnet died from manual strangulation, not from a brain injury. That is a very difficult uh, um, autopsy to navigate. The John Bonnet Ramsey one well, definitely is not the easiest. Anyway, Dr. Burson advised Celeste's preliminary cause of death was asphyxiation due to manual smothering. Where do you think he got this information from if he didn't get it from the body? So basically uh, he finds Celeste's body on, his, on the table when he performs the autopsy. Uh, it's doused in oil, but beyond that there's, there's no sign of injury. And so how does he know what happened to her? Well, he, he, he decides by inference. He, he decides because... By this time, bear in mind it's Friday, Watts has already admitted to it, but indirectly he said Shanann smothered them, Shanann strangled them, right? And I don't think that's the case. I don't think that is how they died. Uh, Dr. Burson also measured the hip and shoulder area of Bella and Celeste and advised the smallest width was nine and a half inches. That's with Celeste. I was aware the opening to the hatch of the tank was only 8 inches in diameter. And this is, in a way, the most shocking part of the Watts case is that the uh, orifice was so narrow. Does that make sense? So this is really just the narrative summarizing the autopsy report. It's, it's uh, actually quite short. Uh, we don't see any of these images. Uh, we don't see the autopsy photos, which are on... I think uh, two PDFs. We don't see those. Uh, let's just go through that. So you can see over here, and this is, um, I think, what Eric Bryan's job was at the autopsy. His job was to photograph the autopsies. 
Um, he says, on October the 16th, I was called by the CBI to assist in documenting the autopsies. The autopsy was scheduled for 10 o'clock at the M McKee Medical Center. I arrived at 0945. I met with CBI agent Tammy Lee and members of the uh, police department. Interestingly, there is Dave Baumhofer. He's not mentioned in uh, the other report, interestingly enough. The autopsies were conducted by Dr. Burson, who was uh, assisted by Dr. W Wiener, Wiener, w Wiener. Not quite sure how to say that. I, I would imagine Wiener is W-I-E. Anyway, the autopsy of Shanann was conducted first. I photographed the victim before and after cleaning. Shanann Watts' body was in an advanced state of decomposition. She was dressed in a t-shirt, bra and panties. A large protrusion was evident near her vagin vaginal area. The remains of her fetus were visible. Now, at the, at the risk of offending people, um, if you just think about what we can't see here, um, the coloring of Shanann's body was probably very similar to that sheet that was photographed and also the shirt that was photographed. So you can imagine a lot of orange and purple and maybe red on her skin, which was normally white or even like a light pink color. You can imagine it being a much darker color. Um, purples and orange and red, um, like a redness. The other thing is it would have been covered in a layer of sand, almost like someone who's been lying directly on the sand at a beach, but with the difference that um, you know, for example, her face would also have sand on it. Um, she might have sand in her mouth. She might have um, like a layer of sand actually on her, the surface of her eyes. And uh, w when that was washed out, well, then it would look a little bit different. But nevertheless, that sand would form like a coating in the same way that the oil would form a coating in terms of the chorin. I don't know what impact the oil would have on the children's eyes, um, but that is one of the first things you look at when you look at a living person. I think it's also one of the first things you look at at a person who's no longer living. So it was uh, Dr. B uh, sorry, it's the agent, uh, agent C by agent Bryant, who photographed the clothing. We see the photos of the of Shanann's clothing in the discovery. We don't see the children's clothing. So that's also something to bear in mind. Okay, we're going to quickly go through the evidence items. Pink oil soaked t-shirt from Celeste, face swabs from Celeste, anterior neck swabs, oral swabs, and so on. Okay, so we just go through all of this quickly, uh, DNA, and so if we just look at this, this is the uh, autopsy body diagram. I always find these very useful, uh, but you can see there's there's nothing really highlighted here. Even in this, it doesn't really even show, which I think is a little bit, um, what's the word? It's not really proper isn't show that there was some damage or whatever to the hyoid bone here. It's just not mentioned. Uh, it talks about the feet, the feet, fetus coming out and then there were bags over her hands to preserve her hands and even so they didn't find any evidence under her fingernails of a sign of attack. Now what that can mean is either um, her hands were pinned down or he washed her hands or the attack was just so quick. Maybe there were chemicals used like ethanol or alcohol and um, she passed out before she could put up much of an attack, even though he was strangling her. So then we go to the autopsy report itself. Um, there are just a couple of things I want to highlight. Um, The purple t-shirt she was found in isn't the same as the t-shirt that she arrived home in. 
Um, so the head head hair is brown, normally distributed. Uh, the eye rides appear brown. The pupils are equal. There are no discernible scleral or conjunctival petechia. And that's kind of what I want to highlight here. Is even though he strangled her, you don't have this classic uh, artifact of strangulation, which is petechial hemorrhage. That is odd. That is definitely odd. But it does correspond to the fact that there's no defensive wound. So it does seem like whatever happened to her happened very quickly. Uh, neck, the neck structures are midline without palpable ad adenopathy. I used to know what that was. I'm not quite sure what that is. Um, it might be, I don't want to speculate. Anyway, there is a linear array of variably sized purple black circular defects. And I think that's another way of saying bruising, like almost from fingers, which extend from the interior aspect of the chin along the jawline up the left aspect of the face towards the left tempo temporal area. So that is something, I don't know why you don't see that on that sketch, the exact uh, nature of th this kind of bruising. Purple black circular defects. Now we would imagine that that is from fingers, but it could be from something else. It could be from her face pressing against something on the floor or something like that. Uh, it's difficult to say what that is if it's not fingers. And then I'm not going to go through the rest here. Um, but except the respiratory system. The right and left lungs weigh 280 and 320 grams and show normal septation. The lung parenchyma is pale tan brown and markedly uh, atelectactic. There are no masses or gross areas of consolidation. Uh, the trachea and main stem bronchi are unremarkable. Um, and so this is this is what is quite disturbing is it does look like Shanann was murdered by manual strangulation but, but there's no sign of that in her lungs and in the uh, Rebecca Zahau case there is in the Susan Roder case also manual strangulation there is so what is going on here um, if she was strangled Violently, why is there no problem with the lungs? So that definitely is uh, a, a problem, um, I feel. That's why I say, and I said it at the beginning, the autopsy reports basically don't really contain anything. There's no smoking gun, which is odd. Uh, Traumatic injury has been previously described. Uh, the hyoid bone and cartilage are intact. The mucosa is unremarkable. Okay, so toxicology, blood obtained from the spleen is submitted. There were, there were, did look like there was elevated amounts of um, blood alcohol, but people said that it was just normal. Which, that is an area where I think, isn't it possible that she was um, strangled, but also chemicals were used that contained either alcohol or ethanol. And bear in mind, Chris Watts powered his truck with, it was a, one of those dual um, uh, energy trucks that you can use uh, liquid natural gas and also um, gas, normal gas. I've spoken about this before in the episode about toxicology, so I'm not going to deal with that again. Um, I just want to go through the autopsy reports of the children to, to look at 
petechial hemorrhage. Let's just go back to that. So this is the body diagram for Bella Watts and there you can see our injuries to the top of her head which you can kind of imagine funny enough there's nothing mentioned here there's nothing men there's nothing shown on this diagram of scrapes on the buttocks or marks on the shoulders which I find frustrating and I find it kind of clumsy but anyway what he does mention is marbling in this area and I, I do believe that there may have been some injury to this area as well so the buttocks and this part and then you've got some kind of um, something that appears to be an injury here and that is where I think they were, they were stomping on her shoulder but also on, on her head and then there's this little circle here which refers to that injury either to the jaw or to the um, frenulum So what I want to look at here is petechial hemorrhages. Um, he says, based on the history, the cause of death is asphyxiation due to smothering. There's no evidence of that. There's no evidence of asphyxiation or smothering. So let's look for the petechial hemorrhages. Um, we go to... the head the head hair is blonde brown the eyes are moderately opacified the irides appear brown the pupils are equal at oh, 0.3 centimeters the sclera at, are dull um, and there there it is there are no discernible conjunctival petechia i just want to quickly go back to shenan watts's autopsy and just look for is there petechial hemorrhages in her in her eyes okay so let's just go to the eyes area the pupils are equal at 0.4 centimeters the sclera are dull, although white. There are no petitia. That that's um, that's in the eyes. That's where you would expect to see them. And so that is a problem we have with the sole idea of manual strangulation. It doesn't fit the classical profile of petechial hemorrhages. The hyoid bone does, so it's looking like Shanann was probably um, str strangled or asphyxiated, but the, but the missing petechial hemorrhages show, well, something's, something different happened there related to that. And the lack of defensive wounds um, corroborate that supposition with the children so you have Bella no discernible um, petitia in her eyes that suggests she wasn't smothered and so we go to to CC as well, well let's just go to the lung area respiratory system um, the lung parenchyma is mottled to purple there are no masses or gross areas of consolidation there are no foreign bodies um, and they are free of thromboemboli. There's also no petitial hemorrhages here. In the case of Susan Roder, she had a lot of um, kind of hemorrhage and damage to her lungs when she, when she lost her life. You must bear in mind that the lungs are these engines that are desperate to get air and they get injured when that air supply is 
uh, cut off. So this is the autopsy diagram for Celeste Watts and it just shows an area of pallor or blanching just over there. And then the her one hand I think degloved. Um, and there you see petechial hemorrhages no no you see that so if we go to the autopsy report for Celeste Watts we go to the area dealing with the um, cardiovascular system respiratory system the right and left lungs weigh 180 and 160 show normal septation um, there are no masses or gross areas of consolidation the trachea and mainstem bronchi are unremarkable no foreign bodies and so again no signs of asphyxia in the lungs if we go to the eyes and the head, um, the eyes are opacified, the eye rides appear brown, um, there's no discernible petitia. Both chore and same thing. Doesn't really make any sense. One possible explanation you could have, which I don't know if I agree with, is that there's no petitia, or you can't see the petitia because the oil has damaged these surface layers that's certainly possible so just a final thing that I want to bring up um, and unfortunately because I'm doing this sort of in a live way you looking at this document as I am I can't kind of go off to to look at my notes I unfortunately can't pause this recording of the document but what I can tell you is that there is a reference to Shanann's lungs that is quite interesting and refers to the collapsing of one lung and um, I'm not sure if that is through this word atelectactic I'm not sure if that is what it refers to but uh, as far as I understand it um, one or both of Shanann's lungs collapsed and I think that is a sign, a cl also a classic sign of a kind of an overdose. I'm just googling that, just see if I can. Eta, 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 tactic. Yeah, so that's right. Uh, atelectasis is a complete or partial collapse of the entire lung or lobe of the lung. It occurs when the alveoli within the lung become deflated or filled with alveolar fluid. Atelectasis is one of the most common breathing complications after surgery. Now, what that is referring to is when you take get an anesthetic uh, as a result of surgery, right? Um, my interpretation of that is that the atelectasis may have been as a result of some chemical that she ingested and it may also be as a result of uh, her being um, strangled against something uh, that was pushing against her lung like, like the edge of a step. In other words, if she was strangled on the stairway. So that's how I interpret that. Um, all of all, all autopsy uh, reports are kind of interpretations and so it is up to your interpretation and that is mine that's the true crime rocket science position so that is it uh, thank you for listening uh, I will be putting up the next section in the uh, the episode about uh, Amanda Knox uh, I'm not quite sure when but it might be within the next day or two and in the the next week I'll be putting up the ninth and penultimate deep dive dealing with the evidence regarding the two vehicles which is actually quite interesting 
Thank you for listening. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do like, share, leave a comment and I'll see you guys next time.